Okay, so my presentation today is on stem cells research, specifically <laughs> embryonic stem cell research. We are going to be talking about how understanding people's opinions on it and where they're getting their knowledge and information from is affecting the field and how it can be uh, changed so that we can make more advancements in the field. So what exactly are stem, cell, stem cells from an embryo? Since there are many different forms of stem cells, including um, induced or potent stem cells and adult stem cells. So the stem cells from an embryo can are pluripotent and can be manipulated into form any other form of a cell. So it can form a tissue cell, a muscle cell, or a heart cell. There are two important characteristics that stem embryonic stem cells have that other forms of stem cells do not. And that is they have the ability to remo renew themselves through cell division as many times as they would like more or less or are manipulated to be. And they have the ability to become specialized cells to replace damaged tissues. So potential benefits are enormous if we were able to study this field. They are harvested usually from the blastocyst when after about five days but when they do this, they are removing the trophoblast of the inner cell mass. So that means that no more development can occur inside of the embryo, which is where the controversy is stemming from with the likelihood of wondering, are we taking a life to save another? Are we killing a child, that, or a potential child, in order to advance medicine? History of stem cells, we would like to think of it that it's only occurred within the last about 30 years. But they actually began being studied in 1740 when Hydra and their regenerative tissues began getting looked at. But it wasn't until 1908 that Alexander Makimov actually coined the term stem cells. And that's what kind of led off on our research. Um, in 1984, the Department of Health and Human Services but a complete freeze on studying embryonic stem cell research and the use of fetuses because of the controversy lying behind it. In 1993, President Bill Clinton signed the NIH Revitalization Act of 1993, which reversed this freeze and allowed for stem cells to actually begin getting studied again. But it was on contingent that the stem cells or the stem cells taken from embryos were being treated the exact same way as if they were live fetuses, which means not a lot of research were being done as far as what we would like to have done it. Um, in August 9, 2001, President Bush prohibited the derivation of these embryonic stem cells, which prohibited therapeutics from being studied. But thanks to former First Lady Nancy Reagan, he did say that the embryos that were currently created could be studied, and he gave a donation, more or less, of $250 million. So we weren't able to do any more um, advancements as far as gaining stem cell lines, which means the researchers were still limited in what they could do. Then later, in 2006, the Stem Cell Research Enhancement Act was passed by both the House and the Senate, but President Bush put it the next day, signed a veto, which was his first veto in office, by the way, that said that they were not allowed to study embryonic stem cells anymore and that they needed to start researching more ways on how to get stem cells using other methods. Later in 2008, Pope Benedict released a statement saying that the Catholic Church would not be supporting embryonic stem cell research, which was going to take a lot of the general public's support away from the study and a lot of funding and tax-based funding comes when the general public supports it. So that removed a lot of money that they needed. In 2009, President Barack Obama signed the Executive Order 13050S, removing barriers to responsible research involving human stem cells. So this, what he basically reversed all of what President Bush had done and allowed federal funds to start going to stem cell research. At this point, though, compared to other countries in the world like China, South Korea, and Japan, where there were less regulations, our advancements in the United States of using stem cells were completely behind what these other countries were doing. 
Then, this past December, President Obama signed the 21st Century Cures Act, which would assure that the um, research projects that they got sent to them would be looked at in a timely manner, so that way continual research could be done and that people weren't trying to halt it by making the process take longer. The question now is what President Donald Trump is going to do. He has stated many times that anything that President Obama has signed into act, he is going to reverse. And his policies on stem cell research have not been stated, which means we don't have any idea what he's up to as far as this bill goes. So, what we do know are the potential benefits of what stem cells have to offer to us. They could cure blindness, they could cure deafness. Using stem cells as a treatment could cure diabetes, muscular dystrophy, Crohn's disease, multiple kinds of cancer. We have a list that goes on and on of all of the potential things that could help us, which make up a majority of what affects us in the health system. But if we don't have the funds, and we don't have the chance for the doctors to research it, or the labs to research it, then how do we find cures for these things, especially um, with diabetes being one of the leading causes of death? So, where does this controversy actually lie? We have the right to life, lack of funding, and the wondering if these researchers are putting out too much hope or too big of a hype for the fact that they don't actually have a whole lot of research done in the field. So, the controversy with the right to life, many people wonder if taking a life is worth using it for the research in order to help save another life as well as when does life actually begin? The age old question that we've been trying to figure out for years. In the Roe versus, Rake, um, Roe versus Wade case, one of the judges actually said, which was about abortion, um, if scientists can't figure out when life begins and can't come up with a clear consensus, then how do we, the jury judicial system, come up with a clear consensus on when we decide life begins? Um, differentiation, which is when cells are able to specialize, and that's when life is actually being able to be supported, doesn't occur until about day 16. So, most researchers believe that that's when life should be considered to occur. Because if you were to take this um, embryo before day 16, it's not going to survive if it's removed from the mother. Then, um, if the embryos aren't actually removed until day five, so you have a span of 11 days of still growth that could occur that you would be able to remove the stem cells with, before differentiation without actually being able, being able to say that you're killing an embryo. Because without it being reaching the, where the cells are specializing, you're, they're just a bunch of cells. They're not actually turning into a fetus. As far as the lack of funding, because of the changes in policies very much, federal funds have just more or less started to be given to embryonic stem cell research. And this is putting, obviously within the past 30 years, it's not a lot of time for them to truly study since these take years and years to do. So what's happening is that researchers are going out to other countries or they're leaving the field entirely because how do you do your study, how do you do your work without money, especially in early stages of development when tax-based funding is necessary in order to get the interest of private-based funding. Now some wonder, is there too much hype? As I showed you in the last slide, these are all the potential stem cell benefits, but the key word is potential. So yes, there have been signs that um, these are working, but there isn't enough research yet to actually solidify that those are what they're going to do. So people are wondering, are science is science over-promising on a research that they might not technically understand yet? And then they're wondering if they're maybe lying in order to get the funds they need. This especially came up in South Korea when a scientist was caught uh, lying about his results and saying he had taken stem cells, cloned them, and then made more stem lines but when asked to redo his study in a um, reserve lab, they found out that his eggs he was using was from his 
um, undergrad research associates, which is clearly very unethical. And then he also was not able to produce the same results. So they found out that he had lied on this very specific paper that got published in the uh, magazine Science. And so clearly it ruined a lot of credibility for the field as a whole. So there's about six current methods of extraction. The first one is altered nuclear transfer, which involves you prevent the egg from fully developing into an embryo. The nucleus of the somatic egg is then altered and reprogrammed before being implanted into the egg. So the stem cells grow, but the egg cells does not form into an embryo. So you're producing stem cells without actually forming an embryo. There's also blastomere extraction, which is when you let the cell grow to an eight cell stage. And they do this in genetic testing now, especially in genetic counseling. They then remove one of the blastomeres so, and then re-put in the seven, the now seven cell um, egg. The egg is still able to grow and function normally and becomes a child, but that last, the cell that they remove is then manipulated to grow and develop into stem cells and they're able to take the stem cells from that. You then have the IPS, IPCSs, which is induced pluripotent stem cells. So these are skin or blood cells that have been reprogrammed back into the embryonic skin cells and they um, are able to become and then be used for embryonic stem cells. Kind of the same thing though, but they have a very low success rate. One study said that when they let this cell grow longer, their success rate was only about 8.5% that they were actually able to get useful embryos. Um, another Two would be um, somatic cell nuclear transfer and using IVF suppressive stem cells. Um, so taking um, induced or in vitro fertilization, they usually fertilize about seven um, embryos and then they implant the one that's going to make the healthiest baby or what they think is going to be the healthiest baby into the mother. The other ones are thrown out. Well, if they were able to take stem cells from that, which is what they do, they would then be able to um, use that as a way instead of wasting material they're reusing resources. Again, the problem though is the low success rate that we have. Now, the last two that they do are umbilical cord stem cells and then taking stem cells from the fallopian tube of women who have had hysterectomies. So, for as far as umbilical cord stem cells, um, they currently do this process where they save your umbilical cord after you've been born and restore it. The problem with this is not many people actually store their umbilical cord. It's expensive and it costs a lot. And you have to have very specific conditions that the um, umbilical cord has to stay in, which are very hard to meet. And doctors and researchers cannot come up on a consensus as to what these stages are. So if they were able to become more concise as to what exact conditions needed to be to keep this and if they could make this process more affordable for everyone, then they would be able to do that. Um, the other one, which is an extremely new technique, is after women have had hysterectomies, they found stem cells in the fallopian tubes. So they've been able to extract the stem cells from there, and this was a study done in Brazil. And then they use that to create the stem cell lines needed. But again, that is a very new research, so there isn't a whole lot of information as far as the longevity of that or the reliableness of it. So, we are talking about people's opinions as far as this goes. That's the whole reason why we have problems with getting stem cell research um, agreed and funded. So obviously, which is more effective? You're going to look at this and you're going to see the one that's probably a little gruesome and it might be grossing you out a little bit is going to be more effective at making you stop smoking than someone who's saying that smoking is bad. Well, according to psychology, stem cells are, um, not stem cells, sorry, but attitudes are affected by a person's emotions, a person's past values, and a person's behaviors. So just telling someone and giving someone information that this is going to work and you know, or again, smoking is bad, it's not going to do anything. Someone has to go through first-hand experience in order to actually make it happen. Um, Ronald Reagan and his wife, Nancy Reagan, are the 
best examples for this, he ended up developing Alzheimer's, and after that she became a huge promoter of stem cell research because she realized how important that, that would be. So my idea for my research was that using a total hysterectomy, you would be able to take the eggs from the hysterectomy and women would be able to donate them. You would then be able to um, use those as where you would gain your stem cells, putting them in, um, fertilizing them in the right petri dish environment and then taking sperm from a sperm bank. It would all be based on donation, so women would be agreeing to it themselves. I conducted a qualitative study on my campus with 69 participants, 60 students, and nine um, a faculty and staff. We did a survey on SurveyMonkey that asked questions as far as where they got their knowledge, how knowledgeable they felt, and agreeing if they thought the stem cell was right. And what we found was that students felt they were more likely to be knowledgeable than faculty and staff. Um, they also got most of their knowledge from class, but a large part got fit from the internet as well, which is a little we, uh, unreliable because it was described as social media. So people getting their knowledge about stem cells and science from social media, not, we don't know if that's actually reliable information. Um, people's agreeing on stem cells, most agreed to it, but if you notice, the percentage of people that were not knowledgeable, which is the orange, were less likely to agree with how they felt about stem cell research and the support of funding than people who were knowledgeable. Same as the current methods. Those who were unsure or not knowledgeable were more likely to not support stem cell research compared to those that, who were. Um, I also then asked, would you be more accepting if alternative methods were then funded? And again, while the support is they want more alternative methods, most did say that if you were unsure or not knowledgeable, you were less likely to support more methods. So what does this all mean? Basically, we need to make sure that the information that we're projecting is reliable and sourceful. We need to make sure that people are understanding this on an emotional basis and realizing the true benefits of it. And we need to make sure, again, reiterating that the information that's being put out is what's accurate and not just based on what you find on social media or what someone is coming up with on their own. So limitations, it was a very small and specific in uh, group of people. They um, were from my college campus. Um, in order to combat this, I would want to study it in multiple locations at multiple places like church, a church group, or a other group, and they would um, be able to combat all, compile all of that data together and then study it from there. I'd also want to find out if um, organ donators, how many organ donators said that they were supportive of embryonic stem cell research just because I think that would be a key factor to see how people actually feel about it. So I'd like to give a special thanks to my Erie College for supporting my research and allowing me the facilities to do it, and then my faculty advisors, Dr. Kaiser, Dr. Swan, Dr. Rodriguez, for all of the help. Um, the cells that we have that you're talking about, the stem cells, are adult stem cells. So they already have a memory in them of some form of specialization. They have been able to manipulate them, but the longevity of them actually staying the cell that we manipulate it to is not as beneficial as using embryonic stem cells, which have their blank slate. They have no memory. We are able to make them into whatever tissue that we want them to be. So while it would be a good quick fix, it's not in the long run something that they want to work with. How that would work? Um, I'm actually diabetic, so that's why I wanted to study this. Um, it, um, the way it does is they are able to implant the stem cells into the body and turn them into, they're called alpha cells. And these alpha cells are then able to become beta cells, which produce the insulin. Because they're stem cells, your body's not going to reject that, um, that cell, that medicine, similar to what they would do if they did like a pancreas transplant and gave you a new pancreas to produce the insulin. So your body recognizes it as its own, 
and then continues to produce the cells, which would reverse the um, diabetes. They've done it in mice, um, where they take in gamma from um, the brain and they've injected it into the stomach, and it was able to convert the alpha cells into beta cells. And then, um, but again, it was just in mice. So with this controversy going on right now, they haven't been able to really apply it to the human system because people are fighting it. So in order to change our opinions on it, we need to make sure we're changing the attitudes so that we can gain more support. I think that's the last question. <laughs>